assalam alaikum ji i think we will wait for another minute and then we will start Okay, let's start. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Kiran Amir and I'm the Director of Operations at Parsa Eco Pakistan Super Hub. I would like to welcome you all to our third session in Echo series on inflammatory bowel disease. It's in collaboration with South Asian IBD Alliance, SIA, a charitable organization in United States with a global presence in South Asia, India, Pakistan, and others. Uh, special thanks to Genex Pharma for unrestricted educational grant. Today's session is titled Clinical Presentation and Diagnosis of IBD. Our expert for tonight's session is Dr. Sadia Abbasi, MD and PhD based in California, USA. Before we move forward, we have to go through some standard announcements. We are part of a global movement called Project ECHO based in USA with an objective to disseminate knowledge and best practices. We do protect patient privacy, so none of the information used in this session will identify any individual or patient. For maintaining discipline, you all are muted, but we do encourage participation. So you can unmute yourself for questions or use the raised hand option or chat box. By participating, you have given the consent for recording and the recorded session will be available on our YouTube channel. Link will be shared in the chat box. For CME credits, please contact Uzair, our coordinator. His number and email uh, are mentioned on the banner. CME credits are affiliated with Jinnah Sin Medical University. Uzair will share the Google form at the end of the session, which will be active for 12 hours. You are requested to fill it as soon as possible to avail the opportunities of CMEs. For the convenience of spokes, the session is bilingual. Please speak in Urdu, English, Hindi, whatever language, language you are comfortable in. If you are interest, interested in Parsa Echo Pakistan publications, please fill the form shared in the chat box. I will now uh, hand over to Ms. Uh, Tina, Ms. Uh, Tina Omprakash, patient and health advocate, president and co-founder of so South Asian IBD Alliance for introducing Saya and Dr. Abbasi. Handing over to Dr. Um, no, Ms. Ms. Tina Omprakash. Thank you so much, Karanji. Um, my name is Tina Aswani Omprakash. I am a Crohn's disease patient based in the United States. My family is originally from uh, Karachi, Pakistan, um, now um, based all over the world and in India. Um, I wanted to uh, go ahead. Uh, should I share some slides, um, Karen? Is that okay? Okay, one second. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to get started with an introduction of South Asian IBD Alliance, um, also known as SIA. Um, we are a registered nonprofit charitable organization in the United States, um, founded by myself, as well as a number of patient advocates um, and clinicians of South Asian descent um, from around the world. Um, so our board is led by doctors and patients, as well as a dietitian um, who all have a specialization with IBD or live with IBD. Um, a little bit more about us. Um, Really, with the dramatically increasing numbers of IBD um, in South Asia and also um, in the diaspora, meaning um, in the United States or in uh, the UK and Canada and Australia, we are seeing large numbers of South Asians being diagnosed with inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, so SIA has really come together to help minimize disparities um, and dispel stigma, but also make sure um, diagnosis can happen early and that patients can receive access to treatment in a timely fashion. 
Um, SIA structure and goals, a little bit about that. Um, we have three arms. Um, we have the patient outreach and advocacy arm uh, led by a physician and a patient advocate um, in, uh, based out of India. We also have a professional development arm um, led by um, one of our Pakistani physicians, um, as well as a physician in India to really help um, you know, educate professionals about this disease. Um, and we have a research arm to try to advance research um, for uh, South Asian phenotypes of this disease to understand this disease a little bit better in our community. Um, we have partnered with Parsa Trust um, and Project ECHO to educate um, general practitioners and gastroenterologists like yourselves about IBD, its pathogenesis, uh, epidemiology, and really how to pr uh, provide the best care and treatment options to patients in South Asia. Um, with that, um, I just wanna share a few of our resources. If you have um, patients who um, need support, um, have been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease or even irritable bowel syndrome, um, we are supporting patients in our IBD Thesis, um, uh patient support group on Facebook. It has about 1,300 members, um, both patients and caregivers from around the world. Uh, we are also on social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn as South Asian IBD. We also have an IBD Thesis page for patients to follow. Um, and uh, you can see our website here, southasianibd.org. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can certainly do so via the email address provided. With that, um, I would love to introduce um, uh, Dr. Sadia Basi. If you can just give me one minute, um, I uh, would love to uh, call her up if she's available um, to turn on her screen. Um, so Dr. Abbasi earned her medical degree from the University of Nevada School of Medicine in 2011 here in the United States. She completed her residency and GI fellowship at the University of Southern California in 2017 and completed her IBD fellowship at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in 2018. She has been practicing at Cedars-Sinai Santa, Santa Monica Gastroenterology where she continues to treat patients with inflammatory bowel disease. She's very passionate about patient advocacy. She attends advocacy meetings with congressional leaders, and she's a member of the Government and Industry Affairs for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and a board member of the American Gastro Association. I just want to welcome Dr. Abbasi here today. Um, she's a renowned gastroenterologist. I have the pleasure of knowing her and having met her, um, and I would love to have her kick off her presentation. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Tina, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. In fact, the honor is all mine to know you and assalamu alaikum everyone and thank you for joining us today for this um, presentation and I'm honored to be here and to be asked to give this presentation on behalf of Saya. Um, so I was wondering if we could pull up the slides. Uh, Kieran, or um, is there someone who can um, bring up the slides? Sure. Uzair, can you bring up the slides? Okay, great. And uh, do I have control of the screen or? Okay. Okay, so I'll just tell you to advance the slides um, as we, okay, thank you very much. So um, yes, everyone, thank you. Thank you again for being here. My name is Sadia Abbasi. Um, my family is originally from um, Karachi, Pakistan, and um, I was born and raised in the United States, but still have very deep roots um, and uh, am, again, very honored to be here. So uh, my presentation tonight will consist of uh, the clinical presentation and diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. I love to have an open discussion, so please feel free to um, keep this conversation going 
going and um, ask questions as we move along, um, or you can also save them for the end. Um, I did allow some time for that as well. So please advance to the next slide. The outline of my talk today will really consist of providing a brief background of inflammatory bowel disease and really going through the clinical presentation and how I approach this diagnosis of um, inflammatory bowel disease, really in terms of symptoms, objective markers of disease, and within objective markers of disease, we do see laboratory results or blood tests, stool studies, and inflammatory markers, as well as discussing imaging criteria and endoscopic evaluation, and finally, really securing that that diagnosis and using these the data that we have present as well as a combination of clinical symptoms to justify a diagnosis and then subsequent treatments. Next slide, please. So brief background of inflammatory bowel disease. I'm, I'm talking to a group of very uh, well-educated gastroenterologists that know that this is a chronic progressive immune-mediated disease that can occur in children and adults. Not to get too caught up in the nuances, but the main diseases when we think about IBD are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And as you know, vary based on their pattern of inflammation and their location of inflammation. I really wanted to hone in on the fact that this is a shared genetic risk factor disease. So uh, in addition to just having inflammatory bowel disease, we know that the patients share genetic risks with other disease processes, such as PSC, sacroiliitis, pyoderma gangrenosum. So not only are these extra intestinal manifestations of disease, but they can occur simultaneous to the disease and actually be the presenting process before someone gets diagnosed with IBD. I think we tend to see that in, in diseases such as ankylosing spondylitis and uveitis, where someone's pr initial presentation is actually not their gut symptoms. And that's because there is a shared genetic risk factor that can then present um, in multiple ways. Because of this shared genetic risk factor, Factor, we know that there's a variable clinical course in inflammatory bowel disease. So any individual patient needs to be evaluated as an individual, although they may share some of the similar um, presentations as a different patient. We really regard inflammatory bowel disease as a patient-specific, um, you know, centered, centered on the patient just to make sure that we are individualizing their care. So the variable clinical course is not only with their typical presentation of inflammatory bowel disease, but also when it comes uh, down to extraintestinal manifestations, that could be so different between each individual patient. Next slide, please. Uh, please wait a bit, it's not moving forward. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> And alternatively, Tina, I could also share my screen. Um, yes, uh, would, Simon, would that, that, yeah, would that, that be I think that will be a lot better. Sure, so Lloyd, why, don't, why don't we try that? I'll share my screen. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. Sure, of course. Okay, can everyone see my screen here? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, let me somehow put this in slide mode. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to advance here. Okay. So when we think about inflammatory bowel disease, the symptoms are really what someone will initially come with. They'll have symptoms. And I try to organize these symptoms in terms of mild, moderate to severe. And again, these are not absolutes, but this is sort of how my mind works when I'm trying to evaluate someone for inflammatory bowel disease. So I think of sort of mild symptoms as mild abdominal distress, not pain, just something is not right. They feel they might be a little bit bloated. Patients may complain of churning in their stomach. They may feel occasional cramping, just some abdominal distress. And I'd like to emphasize that word distress, not pain. They may see mild symptoms also include maybe some changes in bowel habits. Some patients might report that they suddenly feel a little bit constipated or they may have intermittent loose stools. I think of these as more mild symptoms and not something that's occurring all the time, but something that I group into the mild category. In addition, if you already have a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, if your patients are sort of complaining about abdominal symptoms and abdominal distress and changes in their bowel habits, that's something that might alert you to maybe they're having a mild flare of their symptoms. 
moderate disease, that's when I really start thinking of pain. Someone is actually saying, I have you know, discomfort in my abdomen. I'm not feeling well. They are having more frequent bowel movements, or they're maybe frequently more feeling constipation. They're not able to pass a bowel movement. This is moderate symptoms are really when they start feeling more fatigued. They're, they just don't feel good. They're having a poor appetite. They're not exactly losing weight. That's, I think, of more severe, but they are starting to show those signs of not being able to tolerate their meals and not being able to tolerate their symptoms. So then that leads me into severe category when that's when you really start experiencing the weight loss. Weight loss is a pretty severe um, finding because it's very difficult to gain weight and we need our patients to not be losing weight. There's also bloody bowel movements. That's, a, I think, of a more severe category. Fever, or if they end up having complications of IBD, such as a fistula, that's a more severe category. And that sort of helps me determine what to do next and what steps to take um, in terms of making the diagnosis and treating a patient that already holds a diagnosis. Extraintestinal manifestations um, are, we talked about a little bit earlier, but I want to talk about it being an impact on their quality of life. So if you're unable to, if someone is sort of in the category of mild, moderate, to severe disease um, with their symptoms, and you can't really tell how severe their symptoms are, suppose they're straddling, they may have a bloody bowel movement, but they don't have any abdominal pain. You can sort of think of their impact, um, their, their quality of life and how it's impacting them to determine how severe their disease is. So for example, if someone says, I have four bowel movements a day, you know, to, in our mind, that might be not too, not too severe. It might be more mild to moderate, but if it's impacting their education or their work, they're unable to go to work because of their symptoms, or it's impacting their energy level, that's a more severe issue that they're dealing with. So I use the, imp the impact on their quality of life to help, again, guide what I do next. So the way that I look at these um, quality of life factors are their education and work, especially when you're dealing with adolescents. If they're all of a sudden that, you know, kids don't necessarily tell you how they feel, or they may not know that they're having severe symptoms, but all of a sudden their schoolwork starts to decrease, or they start getting, you know, not their typical um, scores in school, then you could think something is really wrong here. Um, if their interpersonal interactions are really impacted, you know, suddenly an uh, adolescent child is not talking to their parents or a, a husband and wife, you know, notice that there, there's some distress between them and their relationships, that can tell you maybe there's something wrong because someone's not feeling well. Fatigue and energy, we sort of talked about. F fatigue is a difficult one because I think a lot of people feel fatigue regardless of their disease process, but it's something to always keep in the back of your mind that if someone's fit really fatigued and their energy level is low, maybe there's some underlying inflammation going on. Emotional health is it's devastating when our patients are going through the process of emotional health and mental health. So I think when we see a patient um, with inflammatory bowel disease, it's important to remember that they'll go through cycles of depression, anxiety, happiness, and stress. And it's very important that we weigh all of those factors in terms of how they're doing overall. So if we see someone that is feeling suddenly depressed, maybe there's something going on with their inflammatory bowel disease. So it sort of alerts you to that. Body image, you know, especially in our patients that have had surgeries, it's very important to keep this in mind. And this can really impact their quality of life, that their disease is not only are they feeling symptoms, but it's all encompassing to their entire life. So I think it's very unique in that way. So what are the extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease? Again, I, I, I tend to group these um, in terms of location and um, organ system. So when I think of ocular, definitely think of the uveitis. In every appointment with a patient with inflammatory bowel disease or when I'm trying to make the diagnosis, I ask them if they have sudden onset vision changes, if they feel a gritty sensation in their eye when they blink their eye, if they feel dry eyes, if they have any sort of vision issues, I tell them to see an ophthalmologist or an optometrist and try to see if we can make a secure diagnosis in that way. Hepatic, we're really looking for primary sclerosing cholangitis. It's very important to check liver enzymes and their blood tests when, they, when they're when they coming in for their appointments, sort of part of their overall labs um, and evaluation when you're, when you're treating them. Arthritis is a very difficult one because it, it can be very um, different and variable as far as symptoms. So you can have a migratory polyarthritis. There's also large joint arthritis, so shoulders, hips, and 
to, it tends to not correlate to disease activity. Sometimes because someone could be in remission and they could still have an arthritis, or they could have a secondary uh, autoimmune condition such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis occurring simultaneous to their inflammatory bowel disease. And then the other thing to always note too is it's very common for me to get a referral from a rheumatologist who's been treating someone's psoriatic arthritis, for example, and that patient is suddenly developing gut symptoms. And this sort of goes back to my original slide of shared genetic risk factors between autoimmune conditions. So if they start developing gut symptoms, you really want to have a high index of suspicion to rule out inflammatory bowel disease. Cutaneous manifestations, some of these tend to parallel disease process like erythema nodosum. Of course, pyoderma gangrenosum is a very important diagnosis to secure. And aphthostomatitis, sometimes you might see someone that just has aphthostomatitis and suddenly then develops gut symptoms and it's a high index of suspicion that they might have inflammatory bowel disease. Psoriasis is a very confusing one because psoriasis can occur independently as a shared genetic risk factor to IBD with IBD, or it can occur as a result of TNF therapy. So it's very important to be evaluating their skin and making sure we're asking, do you have any rashes or any joint pains or any vision issues? And really making sure that you have a high index of suspicion to reevaluate that patient. And it's not uncommon for me to refer to a dermatologist to actually get a biopsy as well. Some of the extraintestinal manifestations occur, tend to occur in <clears throat> Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis at different rates. So I mentioned arthritis. We tend to see it at a very high rate. It's the highest um, prevalent uh, extraintestinal manifestation in IBD. In Crohn's disease, it occurs at a rate of about 33 about a third of patients that will have arthritis. 21% of patients with ulcerative colitis can have arthritis. Pyoderma gangrenosum is a low rate and it tends to occur more commonly in ulcerative colitis. Erythema nodosum tends to occur more in Crohn's disease, but also at a low rate. Aphthostomatitis, I mostly see it in Crohn's disease. I have not seen it much in ulcerative colitis, but it sort of can help you secure a diagnosis as well, and maybe even consider changing a diagnosis if someone has Crohn's colitis and then they have aphthostomatitis and start having abdominal pain, maybe that alerts you to look and see if they have any small bowel or upper GI um, involvement of Crohn's disease. Uveitis, as I mentioned, tends to occur more commonly in Crohn's disease. And PSC occurs more in ulcerative colitis. And psoriasis, I, I agree with these numbers that Crohn's, it tends to occur at more rate in Crohn's disease, but I do see it in ulcerative colitis as well, but overall a low rate. So we talked about symptoms and how when someone has inflammatory bowel disease or when they're when you suspect that they have inflammatory bowel disease they can have these mild to moderate to severe symptoms we talked about how it can impact their quality of life and we talked about extraintestinal manifestations those are all just one component of making the diagnosis of IBD or monitoring a patient with IBD but Objective markers are very important because as we know, clinical symptoms do not necessarily correlate to disease activity and clinical symptoms are not the only way that we make the diagnosis of IBD. So I use a combination of blood tests, laboratory evaluation. I really look for their ESR and CRP, which is inflammatory markers, and try to see if these are elevated in the patients, which if they are, it gives you a high index of suspicion that someone is flaring or someone has active inflammation. Leukocytosis, it, this should not be a really high number unless, they're unless they have severe, severe disease, but I, it's not uncommon for me to see a mild leukocytosis in a clinic patient. They may have a white blood cell count of 12 or 14, and it sort of tells me that maybe there's some inflammation, active inflammation that's occurring. I tend to see the leukocytosis of 20 and 25 and severe acute colitis, so that tends to be someone that's hospitalized. Anemia is a big one, big one, big one. I've learned a lot of lessons over the years with anemia, and I, it's very important that it's not only are you screening them, uh, screening your patients with inflammatory bowel disease for anemia, but suspecting it in someone that is, does not hold the diagnosis. So it's not, if someone has diarrhea and anemia, our guidelines say that you should really evaluate them for inflammatory bowel disease. 
it's also a good marker for someone that has small bowel Crohn's, for example. So someone that has small bowel Crohn's may not have a lot of symptoms, even if it's just mucosal Crohn's disease or mild Crohn's disease. But if they have anemia, that tells you that their disease is active. And so you can go back in and look and evaluate this patient. So I have a patient that has small bowel Crohn's. She's not at, she doesn't have any gut symptoms, but she came for anemia and made the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. She was doing really well in remission. When I saw her again a year later, she had anemia. And I go back and look, and sure enough, her Crohn's disease is active. So it's just one of those things that, you know, to keep in the back of your mind, there's all there's a lot of anemia pathways in the GI literature. So it's very important that we're evaluating this and making sure that we're monitoring anemia. Thrombocytosis, again, I tend to see thrombocytosis in someone that has acute, acute severe disease, and it's usually a reactive thrombocytosis. And then vitamin deficiencies. I check vitamin deficiencies once or twice a year on my clinic patients and definitely in the hospitalized patients. Mostly, I, I listed here iron and B12. I do tend to check a ferritin um, with the iron panel, but the other vitamins I routinely check are vitamin D and folate. Um, they're in a hospitalized or a severe acute patient. I check the zinc level and... Um, other B vitamins, including thiamine and B6, and just making sure that, again, we're repleting those vitamin deficiencies in the patients and helping them. You know, there's a lot of evidence that repleting this is very important and it can help them with their disease process. In addition to lab analysis, I use stool studies to determine how someone is doing and to help secure a diagnosis. So fecal calprotectin, when it's elevated, is a, it's helpful because this is it's a marker that you can track over time and see if anyone isn't, if their disease is improving, if you have them on therapy, or if you have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease on therapy and you're tracking them proactively and you see that all of a sudden their fecal calprotectin is elevated, it's something that can help tell you and help you that maybe they have active disease, even though they may be relatively asymptomatic. So I use a combination of symptoms and objective markers to not only see how the patients are doing proactively, but also to help secure a diagnosis diagnosis and use more evidence to make the diagnosis. I don't tend to check routine white fecal white blood cell. I know a lot of people do that, but I don't find it that helpful in clinic patients, but we do check it in hospitalized patients. It's not something I track, but it is something that's in the literature. And then whenever I have a patient that comes to me with diarrhea, whether they're inflammatory bowel disease or not, it's very important to rule out enteric pathogens and parasites, C. diff. So one of the first things I tell people that have a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease is be, pre be prepared to drop off a lot of stool tests because we do look at them pretty often. And if there's any consideration of them flaring, it's always important to make sure that they're, they're not subsequently infected or super infected and not actually having a flare of their disease. So very common to do that. <clears throat> I use imaging, again, as another tool to help me monitor disease activity. So when we see someone who has severe disease, we are they're coming in with 20 bowel movements, they have severe acute colitis, we definitely get an x-ray, we rule out megacolon. Some of my patients that had just a lot of pain and they're in the clinic, not necessarily in the hospital, I obtain abdominal x-ray, may see some focal, may see some fecal loading. Um, sometimes we see intestinal wall thickening. Some of the very common findings of in an x-ray are thumb printing and a pipe appearance. You can see in this picture here, it just looks like a the, um, the distal colon here just looks like a pipe. So not an uncommon feature to see on an x-ray and a plain film is pretty easy to obtain. So I use it as a tool to help me, especially when I'm not able to get a more advanced imaging study um, in a timely fashion. The other CT abdomen pelvis, I think anyone that goes to the hospital automatically gets a CT <laughs> abdomen pelvis. But again, it's something that I do order, especially if I don't have a secure diagnosis and someone's complaining of a lot of pain. So I do use a CT scan. And if I see these findings of intestinal wall thickening, some, unfortunately, sometimes you see an intra-abdominal abscess. Again, that alerts you that someone might have inflammatory bowel disease and that they need more, they may need a larger workup. Enterography is a very common thing that we order in the United States, a very common, a common imaging modality. So when we do enterography, whether it's CT or MRI, we are looking for bowel wall hyperemia. And 
the good thing about an MRI is that it can also really well detect uh, perianal disease and soft tissue, anything in soft tissue that you may see. So we do use MRI quite a bit um, for our patients with Crohn's disease. I did not list it here, um, but it's something to also consider in your patients with inflammatory bowel disease is intestinal ultrasound. And I think that we're going to see this major, major um, role for intestinal ultrasound because it's less invasive, less cumbersome, e more easy to do. And it, again, what you're looking for with intestinal ultrasound is bowel wall thickening, mostly in the terminal ileal area. So again, an emerging role for intestinal ultrasound. When making the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, we gold standard is colonoscopy and endoscopy. And um, the, the way that we use these tools is not only to see endoscopic appearance of the intestines and the, mostly the colon and probably the small bowel, but also to stage the disease. So I put the scoring stage here for the Mayo criteria for ulcerative colitis. And what we see is a score of zero is normal mucosa. A slight amount of erythema, uh, decreased vascular pattern, and mild fireability is it really a score of one in ulcerative colitis. A score of two is when you start seeing marked erythema, really absent vascular pattern, friability, and there's slight erosions here. But once you start seeing significant ulcerations and spontaneous bleeding, that's when you really want to think of stage score of three of the Mayo score of ulcerative colitis. Our goal when we do this is not only look at the appearance of the colon, but also to take a biopsy. And typical biopsy features that you'll see in inflammatory bowel disease consists of crypt abscess formation. We can see this here. You'll also see the pyloric gland metaplasia. And really, you're working very well with the pathologist to read these slides and making sure that we're identifying all of them. Transmural inflammation, so you'll really start to see the submucosal involved in the muscularis mucosae. And granuloma is pathognomonic for Crohn's disease. Disease. So, you know, you might see the granuloma um, in a biopsy, and that really helps secure the diagnosis. So in addition to clinical symptoms, laboratory evidence, stool tests, and imaging studies, you then use the appearance and endoscopic evaluation to secure your diagnosis. And a lot of times people say, well, why do you need all the other four things when you when you could just go in and a scope? Well, you're not going to always scope your patients every two weeks. You know, you want to be able to follow their other markers as you're making the diagnosis and seeing how they're doing when you initiate therapy. I use a lot of wireless capsule in my practice um, because you always want to make sure you're evaluating the small bowel. So again, I, there is this phenomenon of patients not having a lot of symptoms, but maybe they just have anemia or maybe they just have a slight diarrhea and their endoscopy is normal and their colonoscopy is normal, but your index of suspicion for inflammatory bowel disease is high. And those are the patients that I use wireless capsule in. And <clears throat> these are some of my patients. You can see that they're um, features here that you'll see like ulcerations in their small bowel, pretty deep ulcerations here in their small bowel. And sometimes you'll even encounter a stricture um, that the capsule was hopefully able to pass through. But it, again, it gives you help secure that diagnosis. And this wireless capsule is something that you can monitor patients with. Enteroscopy is very sometimes you know, even here in Los Angeles with an abundance of um, of institutions that do um, enteroscopy, it's sometimes still difficult to get patients in on time. So push enteroscopy and balloon enteroscopy to help, again, secure the diagnosis. And sometimes I use this if a lot of the data that I've since collected on the patients is not clear. So if, for example, if you're wondering if someone has NSAID-induced enteropathy or if they have Crohn's disease, sometimes I then use uh, use a push or a double balloon to get the biopsies. So, you know, you'll see those typical features on biopsies that you may not see in someone that has been using NSAIDs, for example. So that's when I start to use this. I, you can also use enteroscopy, especially double balloon, in someone that has a stricture to dilate the stricture um, if you're not considering surgery for them. So again, another not only tool to help you manage your patients with inflammatory bowel disease, but to make the diagnosis as well. Surgical specimens, we hope to never have our patients go to surgery. Unfortunately, it happens um, not uncommonly. And the classic features that you'll see, this is a colon, um, are this just really raw sort of tissue, really erythematous, granular, friable. And this is 
a specimen that this person, you know, was not responding to therapies and, you know, had to unfortunately get their colon removed um, in ulcerative colitis. The pattern of inflammation here, as you can see, is continuous and uh, not patchy, as you would see in Crohn's disease. So surgical specimens can also help secure the diagnosis. Um, the other part of surgical specimens is if someone comes in perforated, for example, they just come in, have a small bowel perf or, you know, something like that. They go to surgery and have that segment removed they can then get the diagnosis with the surgical specimen of Crohn's disease, and then you could treat them postoperatively. I, I wanted to talk briefly about the scoring criteria. So um, the I sort of discussed how I use symptoms in my mind, how I classify them as mild, moderate to severe. There are actual scoring criteria for that so that you can determine how you will start therapy in patients and when you need to initiate and if someone is super sick that you need to send them to the hospital. So the true love and with severity index for ulcerative colitis is very commonly used to score the disease process. And this is just based on a combination of clinical symptoms and um, objective markers of disease. So mild disease, we sort of think of someone that has less than four bowel movements a day. Their vital signs are pretty stable. They're not febrile. They're not too anemic um, and their inflammatory markers are normal. So this is just someone that has more frequent bowel movements, maybe a little hint of anemia, but not too severe. In moderate disease, that's when you really start thinking of someone that has a little bit more frequent bowel movements. Their vital signs are still stable, but they're a little bit more anemic and their inflammatory markers are normal. So again, anemia, big, big marker of not only how someone is doing with the diagnosis, but maybe indicates to you and tips you off that someone has inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> Severe symptoms are really when we start thinking of someone with more than six bowel movements per day. This is when their vital signs start to uh, creep up, where they become tachycardic with a um, pulse rate more than 90 beats per minute. Their temperature, they develop a fever and um, or, or at least a higher temperature. Their hemoglobin is much lower, so they are pretty anemic. And your objective markers of um, inflammation are present, and you'll start to see these on the rise. I use the... Um, the simple uh, clinical colitis activity index for my patients in the clinic. So this is for, uh, for, for colitis. So if I have someone in clinic, I try to always have an objective marker of how they're doing. So, you know, when we see patients, we just say, how, how many bowel movements are you having? How are you feeling? They're like, I'm feeling fine. I'm having this, but I tried to get an objective marker so I could track this over time. And I put it in my note every single time. So this really consists of how many bowel movements are they're having. And the intervals are a little bit shorter. So you can actually track them a little bit more clearly. So someone that has four bowel movements gets a score of one, for example, but if they have three, they get a score of zero. The frequency, nocturnal frequency of bowel movements, again, important to measure. I ask them about their urgency, if they have any urgency. And blood in the stool, always important to note. And they're just their, their overall impression of their well-being. If someone tells me, you know, I'm okay, I don't feel that great. I can I can document that they had a score of one here. But if the, in the following appointment, they tell me, I, you know, I, I, I feel terrible. I could document that they have a score of three here and that might increase their, their score. And that's, again, just another uh, you know, indication to me that maybe they're not doing so well. Maybe they are having active inflammation and maybe their disease is active. So these are all just markers to very be, be very proactive in diagnosing and monitoring your patients and may secure a diagnosis for you. Harvey Bradshaw index, what we use for Crohn's disease. So I use this uh, simple index in my clinical patients. And again, very much getting an objective number when I see them. So um, I use their general well-being. I ask them how they're doing, making sure that they're that score, if it's changing, that I'm being very proactive and monitoring them. Abdominal pain is relative, but I try to ask them, what, how severe is it compared to last time? Is it more severe or less severe? I really try to get a sense of what they are feeling. And the number of liquid stools per day, this abdominal mass. So when you feel them, do you feel a mass? And then their complications, and they get a score for every one of their complications. Do they have arthritis this time? Do they have you know, a fistula. And so this objective number allows me to track my patients with inflammatory bowel disease very proactively. If their number is on the rise in the clinic, I could say, you know what, there's something going on. We need to restage and find out if they're having active inflammation. The goal, the goal of course, is to catch disease early and intervene early.
So just some brief conclusions. Um, as we know, IBD is a chronic progressive disease, a very extremely variable clinical course. You know, it's very important to treat every patient as an individual because not every patient will have the same findings. And it's very important to not get grounded in what we think is, is someone that has active inflammation should look like. The diagnosis is based on clinical symptoms, and I I really stress objective markers. Very important to use those objective markers. It's not uncommon for another gastroenterologist to ask me, you know, I have this patient with diarrhea. They have Crohn's disease. They're feeling really well, but they have they still have diarrhea, or they're still not feeling well. What do I do about that? Should I change their medication? And the first question I always ask them is, what's their calprotectin? What's their anemia? Do they have anemia? Do they have inflammatory markers that are elevated? Because you really want to use those objective markers to categorize the stage of their disease. Um, endoscopy with biopsies gold standard. You want to really see these features of chronic inflammation that are on pathology to really secure the diagnosis. But know that all the other findings and all the other workup that we do to make the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease are markers that you can subsequently use in the future to track their disease process. So although you know it's very important to get the colonoscopy and take the biopsy, it's very important to also make sure that you're looking for anemia, looking at their intestinal ultrasound or their MRI, uh, and then you know getting their vitamin and nutritional factors. Because again, I, I've seen iron deficiency just be the only sign that someone comes in with, and then they have the diagnosis diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So very important to get all those um, data and objective marker points. And then finally, using the scoring system to determine severity, which can drive therapeutics. So as we know, the FDA guide, well, at least in the United States, the FDA guidelines for a lot of these medications are for either mild disease, moderate disease, or severe disease. So we don't want to be putting people in on the wrong therapeutics if they um, if their disease process is rated at a, at a different severity. I also use these scoring systems, again, to track patients subsequently and see how they're doing and being very proactive to tell me if someone is undergoing, if someone's experiencing a flare or not. So just very important to sort of, you know, use these uh, tools at your disposal just to care for your individual patient. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Satya, uh, Dr. Asad here, and uh, for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, before uh, uh, we take some questions, uh, uh, one thing uh, that uh, I would like to know is what advice, because in the audience uh, in front of you, we have a lot of general practitioners, uh, and they're all across Pakistan. So uh, it, it, was, it was a wonderful talk, and we do have some markers which are available like uh, 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 calprotectin levels, of course, we, 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 you know, anemia and some other inflammatory markers. So what advice would you give them? Obviously, we are looking at patients uh, from far-flung areas uh, who come for follow-up. They have documented uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, what do you do in practice? And then we have uh, Professor Altaf here. I saw the name of Shanil here in Pakistan. Then we can, you know, sort of try to help the people out here. So first, what's your take on that? I, I, I think when you have someone with the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis, and I sort of highlighted on this, it's very important to follow them proactively. So if you have someone with the diagnosis of IBD, you know, don't just rely on them telling you they're feeling well. You know, it's it's very important that you are proactively checking their markers, checking, and anemia is a very, you know, pretty robust thing that you can check for. So very important that you're checking for anemia. Very important that you're checking a scoring system. And th that's which is why I brought that up because of course resources are different depending on locations that you are in. So, but the, the scoring systems, um, especially the ones that we use in clinic, you don't require any sort of blood test. They're just some, you know, your your monitoring of um, how someone is doing. So if someone says, you know, I'm feeling fine, I, I think a lot of patients, if they're feeling fine, they don't want to give a lot of information. They don't want to be in your office. They want they're feeling fine. They don't, they just want to live their life. But it's very important to prod them a little bit. Well, what does fine mean? How many bowel movements are you having in a day? You know, and do you have any abdominal pain? You know, I, I really I really try to fill out those scoring systems so that I can have an objective objective number that I can then follow. 
So that's sort of how I, I you know, approach this disease. Um, and a generalist can do this. You know, it's not something that you necessarily need to always scope, you know, do a colonoscopy in um, a patient for, but you can just say, you know, how are you doing and getting objective evidence of how they're really doing. So then you could track those numbers. That's, that's how I approach it. You know, so you're, you're not necessarily using a lot of resources in that way. If you have the resources available, then yes, I check the vitamins, you know, their vitamin profile once or twice a year, or I'm, you know, er, er, my patients that are on biologic therapy, you know, it's really seeing them every one to two months when they're initially getting started, but when they're on therapy and, you know, stable, maybe, you know, quarterly, I see them or twice a year, I see them just depending on what process they're on. And then again, proactively monitoring them. I think when once you have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, you want to be able to intervene early. And I think our field is sort of shifting towards not only treat to target, which is that in order to classify someone as a being in remission, they, you know, their objective markers have to be better, their clinical symptoms have to be better, their endoscopic score has to be better, all those things have to be better, but histopathology also has to improve. But it's also part of the goals is to intervene early. So I tried to highlight on intervening early for that reason, because we don't want our patients that are on, you know, therapeutics and, you know, coming to us to flare without us being able to predict it or know about it. Thank you. Uh, there is one question in the chat. Uh, how much rise in ESR and CRP is significant in suspecting the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease? It's a very, very good question. And I could tell you there's not a good answer because the, uh, as I've discussed before, it's individualized treatment. So it, it's an individualized approach. So you can have someone that definitely has, you know, if, if this in, in our lab, a, a normal CRP is less than one. I've seen patients with a CRP of three that have severe disease. And I've seen patients with a CRP of 150 that have severe disease. So it's individualized so you don't use any indiv you don't use any one test to tell you how someone's doing so you then use the ESR CRP and you ask them how they're doing you then check their labs you check see if they're anemia so if someone has a CRP of two not too bad that's not a too bad CRP but their hemoglobin is eight that that's the problem you know so it's it's not just any one individual marker that'll tell you how some how significant someone is. Thank you. We have uh, two, I think, raised hand. Uh, Faiza, Fahad, uh, Uzair, if you can unmute them. And she wants to ask a question. Okay, uh, the question is how, how can we keep track and treatment plan from Cohen's disease in a five-year-old child after ileostomy? Okay, so I, I don't do a lot. I, I don't do any pediatrics. <laughs> um, I tend to be an adult gastroenterologist, but I, I could tell you the approach postoperatively that we do in adults with ulcerative uh, with Crohn's disease that have undergone surgery. We tend to start them on medications to prevent a further um, to prevent further activation of disease. As you as you know, the most common site of recurrence of IBD is at the anastomosis or near the anastomosis, and so. Um, you know, you weigh their risk factors. I think there used to be a practice where we would see someone with inflammatory bowel disease, they would undergo their initial presentation would be a surgery, they undergo their surgery, and we think we're done. And I think we're not seeing that trend anymore. I think we tend to start these patients on biologic therapy and monitor them very proactively by repeating their colonoscopy and looking at the anastomosis nine to 12 months after they have had surgery, tracking them with, again, all these markers of disease, anemia, fecal calprotectin, very proactively as you would with any other patient. Five-year-old is devastating. And it's probably one of the reasons I don't do a lot of pediatrics. Um, but, you know, it's, again, I, I'm sure it's probably the same approach of just being very proactive in the monitoring and starting them on therapy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there's another question about how to differentiate uh, tuberculos tuberculous intestinal ulcerations and ulcerations due to inflammatory bowel disease. So I, I can answer this question because I trained at <laughs> at um, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where we actually saw a lot of tuberculosis. And um, I actually had a patient with um, 
terminal ileitis that was due to tuberculosis. The, the way that we suspected the diagnosis of tuberculosis was not only on biopsy, but we also had a um, elevated, um, uh, we, you know, when we were going to start therapy, the quantiferon gold was elevated and their, PP, their uh, tuberculosis um, PPD test was also positive. So biopsy is probably the gold standard, but, you know, it's very hard to biopsy a if the suspicion is very high. So I would use blood tests and I would use, um, you know, to determine if that, and then of course, history is everything. So if they were in a tuberculosis area that was endemic, you know, it's very important to weigh that history very, very cautiously. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I go to Professor al Alam, there is uh, one raised hand, uh, Ghulam Rehmani. Do you want to ask a question? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Do you want to ask a question, uh, the, uh, Ghulam yes, Rehmani, sir? Ji, please yes, go sir, ahead. Yes, sir. sir, my question is, is as we use the selum, uh, fecal call protector level as a screening test to differentiate between IBS and IBD, we see raised fecal uh, uh, call protector level even in the setting with the celiac disease as well. Yes. So how much higher... Uh, how much higher levels of fecal carboprotectin level should be to make a show that this patient may have an IBD? So I will answer the same way I answered the CRP and ESR question. Not one individual test will tell you if someone has inflammatory bowel disease. So I use fecal calprotectin as a marker to tell me someone has, someone could have inflammatory bowel disease. I then combine that number with other modalities to make the diagnosis. So celiac disease, very, a little bit more straightforward in terms of diagnosing, because you could check their celiac serologies, you could check an endoscopy and biopsy for a marsh lesion in their small bowel. So it's, it's a little bit more straightforward of a diagnosis on occasion. But definitely you could see an elevated fecal calprotectin in someone and not have a whole source for it. We see that all the time. You know, we actually discourage people from checking it unless their suspicion of IBD is very high. So <clears throat> with the way that I use fecal calprotectin is one more marker of inflammatory bowel disease. I then combine it with imaging tests, lab tests, clinical symptoms, and then um, endoscopic appearance of the colon and biopsy. So it's just one more, you know, notch on that list of things that could be positive. Now, that being said, you know, you, these fecal calprotectins that are greater than like 2000, like the absolute upper limit of normal, I, you know, I've had that situation where someone's having a lot of diarrhea, they don't know what's going on, they, they've done the colonoscopy and it's normal and their fecal calprotectins are like, you know, 1500. Where they usually tend to miss the disease is small bowel. So that's when I then get the capsule, the MRE, or even the enteroscopy to see if there's profound small bowel disease. And I never rely on just the colonoscopy or just the endoscopy. You know, you really have to look at the small bowel. And sometimes you may not see it in the mucosa of the small bowel. It may be transmural disease. Although I haven't really seen a fecal calprotectin that high in just small bowel disease or even transmural disease, but you never know this disease is, you know, such a variable clinical course for every individual that it's important to just make sure. But I do go hunting for it if that's the case. So I then get the MRIs. I do all those things. Thank you. Uh, I can see a lot of questions in the chat and Shanil is helping us out there. Uh, we are going, to, this is an ongoing program. So we are going to cover treatment because if we, if, if we go into treatments right now, it will be, it, we won't be able to answer any question. Uh, and similarly about pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, we are going to have separate sessions on that and a lot of other things to come. So uh, I go to Professor Altaf Alam uh, for his comments. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadia, for uh, an excellent talk and emphasizing one over and over again that, you know, in a proper setting, doing a set of things is the key to success and making a right diagnosis. So it's not easy always. Uh, as a course director of Parsa Echo, really, uh, it, nothing gives me more pleasure than a wonderful talk by an eminent uh, speaker and also good participation. We have had almost 80 participants for today's session, which is excellent. Uh, my question, Dr. Sadia, would be that after doing all these things, sometimes uh, 
we still cannot categorize our patients into either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Um, you know, they have colonic disease, they, uh, the histology and uh, the other markers are all. Uh, so what else can we do uh, to categorize them into either Crohn's or, or, um, or UC? And what percentage of indeterminate colitis do you see in your practice? Thank you. It it's a very, it's a, and thank you for your kind words. It's a very good question. I think about five years ago, I used to really say, do we have to strongly differentiate these two? And in the United States, the reason to do that is because therapeutics are different. So it's a very good question that some therapeutics are FDA approved for ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. There is a whole category of IBDU. And as we're starting to see this emerging essence of a lot more medications that are either FDA approved for Crohn's disease or FDA approved for ulcerative colitis. Now that we have experience with some of these medications, we're seeing that eventually they do get FDA approval for the other disease process. So one example would be vetolizumab. Vetolizumab, FDA approved for ulcerative colitis in 2014, then received FDA approval for Crohn's disease a few years later. I think when I have someone that I can't make the differentiation on, I classify them as IBDU, and I don't stress too much about trying to differentiate that because I can then utilize a wider variety of medications to treat them. So if I suspect that they might have Crohn's colitis, and yet their pattern appears more like ulcerative colitis. So the, the, I, I mentioned this case, the classic case of someone with Crohn's colitis, but then they have aphostomatitis. You know, what do you do with that patient? I say treat what's in front of you. So treat treat the disease that's in front of you. If you suspect that this is Crohn's disease, or if you, if you suspect that this is ulcerative colitis, but they have aphostomatitis, you know, you may err on the side of saying, maybe this is more Crohn's colitis, but I'm going to go ahead and treat the colonic disease and see if this improves. And if it doesn't, or if they have symptoms, then you could say, you know what, then I could reach for one of the categories that may be one of the medications that may be approved for Crohn's disease with the diagnosis of IBDU, I could say favors Crohn's colitis. So that's sort of how I try to, you know, make that differentiation. But I don't, now the, with the practice, I don't try to necessarily, you know, if I, if I don't know, I don't try to strictly, di you know, differentiate it. I will say, you know, also, I will say this is um, IBDU favors Crohn's colitis or IBDU favors ulcerative colitis. And then I can use the different, you know, tools at my disposal to treat them. But it's a good question because when you do have someone with IBDU, you're going to screen for different extraintestinal manifestations. So it's a little bit more work for the doctor, but it's very important to treat that person as an individual. So you will, you know, you will look for the PSC. You will look for things that are more common in either one of those disease processes. But again, I think that's a better approach to the patient. Uh, Jeep, uh, Shadia, last question in the chat. I uh, just uh, I'm utilizing the last minutes. Uh, rectal involvement in Crohn disease and perianal involvement in ulcerative colitis. How common it's in your experience, its prognosis as compared to the classical involvement? So. Yeah, you know, it's a very good question. I, I think that what we used to think was typical no longer exists. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't know why that is. I, I don't see a lot of perianal involvement in ulcerative colitis. When I see perianal involvement, that's when I start thinking of Crohn's disease. Um, but I see rectal involvement in Crohn's disease. That's not uncommon. It's similar to, you know, seeing PSC in Crohn's disease. I don't think that the, what we used to think were firm gu guidelines and firm classifications. I, you know, I personally don't think that they exist anymore because I've been you know, commonly and more routinely and daily surprised by what this disease process can do and the presentation that we're seeing in patients. So again, if I, if, it, if you have someone who you're convinced has ulcerative colitis, but then they have perianal disease and you don't want to necessarily call them Crohn's, you can then put them in that category as um, uh, of IBDU favors Crohn's disease or favors ulcerative colitis and then make your decisions on therapeutics based on that criteria. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We are just, uh, it's about time. Uh, 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 audience it's been a wonderful session. Uh, jitne questions hai, uh, we are also tracking them. Or agar aapke paas numbers hai, uh, Uzair ka or uh, Janix uh, is helping us uh, reaching uh, all across Pakistan for this program. Uh, 
अगर इफ यू कैन लीव योर क्वेश्चन विद दैम तो हम इन एडवांस जो स्पीकर है उनको ये क्वेश्चन ताकि वो दे ट्राई देर बेस्ट टू आंसर दिस दिस क्वेश्चन और थोड़ा सा uh, uh, मुझे जरा जालम होना पड़ता है वेरी सॉरी uh, क्योंकि uh, in, in time, मुझे कुछ क्वेश्चन uh, करने पड़ते हैं लेकिन uh, हमारे जो एक्सपर्ट्स हैं एज यू कैन सी के शानेल और सारे लोग uh, जो हैं इसको साथ साथ आंसर भी कर रहे हैं uh, लेकिन योर क्वेश्चन मीन अ लॉट टू अस क्योंकि इट्स अ टू वे लर्निंग प्रोसेस इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी वन वे लर्निंग और इसी पे हमने बेस करना है और मैं उजैर से कहूंगा कि और इवन जेनिक्स के आपको सारा प्रोग्राम शेयर कर दें ताकि आपको पता हो कि जो अपकमिंग टॉपिक्स हैं हमने टीबी न्यूट्रिशन ट्रीटमेंट बहुत सारी चीजें कवर करनी है अभी इट्स आई थिंक वी आर इनटू थर्ड और फोर्थ सेशन ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम तो इनशाला आपको अपने सारे सवालों के जवाब मिल जाएंगे और अगर नहीं मिलेंगे तो वील हैव एक्स्ट्रा सेशन यू नो फ्रॉम द एक्सपर्ट टू आंसर दो So, uh, uh, Tina, if you have anything to add, and then we go to Kiran to wrap up the session. Yes, Dr. Asad, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, this session, Dr. Abbasi. You did a fantastic job um, covering many of the details around um, di diagnosis of IBD. Um, I will just say we are going to have many future sessions. Dr. Tosif Ali, Dr. Sabina Ali, Dr. Shanil Khadir, and I are working on future sessions. Um, so stay tuned. Um, we are going to be presenting each month. I think we are just skipping December for the holiday season, um, but we will resume again uh, end of January. Please look out. Um, we will be having many, many more sessions. Um, TB, uh, biologicals, all of this will be covered in upcoming sessions and pediatric IBD, all of it all will be covered. Thank you, thank you so much from the SIA front. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Are muted, or Kiran? You are muted, please. I'm sorry. So we are grateful and thankful to all the participants uh, who have joined us, along with the, our expert uh, Dr. Sadia and Saya, Genex Pharma for the unrestricted educational grant, uh, our course director Professor Taf Alam, and our team at Parsa Eco Pakistan. And as uh, Tina mentioned, uh, this series is designed to have sessions once a month. So keep us uh, keep joining us and be part of the IBD series in the future. Allah Hafiz for now. Uh, Uzair, you can call off the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. You sure, ma'am? I'm going to call off this meeting. Thank you, everyone.